Hi everyone, welcome to Listen to the Stars. My name is Nicole. Today I have a very special guest on my channel, and this is a channel dedicated to astrology, the cards, and spirituality in general. So if you're interested in any of those things, please subscribe, and if you'd like a consultation with me or a coaching session with me, and you can go to my website, nicolebrenny.com, to check that out. But today it's all about our guest, Baba Jeet, from Exotic Astrology, and today we're going to talk about um, the most important house in the birth chart and why. Why are some conjunctions more frequent than others that you find in the birth chart? So why are planets sitting together more frequently than others? Yogas that cause fear. We're also going to talk about how the zodiac belt itself is arranged and basic remedies for the fifth house. So depending on if you have a specific planet in the fifth house, what you can do for it. So stay tuned to hear all of those topics. And since you guys have probably already seen Babajit, he probably doesn't need that much of an introduction, but you guys don't know that much about him. He interviewed me for the Omens episode on my channel, but let's find out about you. So tell us a little bit about you, who you are, how you got started in astrology and all of that. Yeah, thank you very much for inviting me. Uh, great pleasure to be here. So... I was always interested in uh, spiritual topics uh, because I am from India especially and I was born in not a very religious family but uh, I had that inquisitiveness inside that even within Hinduism which is the mainstream Vedic culture today in India I've always wanted to know who among the three primary deities Brahma, Vishnu and Shiva who among these three are the super, is the supreme who is the uh, all all around he who is the main man so i used to ask to my mother uh, my dear mother can you tell me who among these three is the supreme but the only reply i used to get is why do you ask too many questions oh, no. <laughs> because uh, my mother she couldn't answer of course she is not a spiritual person that she will have those answers but i always used to do my own research and reading different books then going to different places and I used to search always that what is the truth. And sometimes I used to sit doing nothing. And sometimes I used to wonder, what is this universe? What is this galaxy? What I'm doing here? I see that somebody is getting up in the morning and going, like, what's going on in this world? I mean, where are we heading ultimately? No? What, what's the destination? Yeah, you were a if truth seeker. We, yeah, if we have to die only, then what's the point of all this, right? Because we are anyways going to die. Yes. <laughs> Just maintaining your stomach till you die. I mean, that's the goal. Then why to maintain it all? You can die now also, right? <laughs> so that led me to a feeling inside that there must be something beyond this world. This world should be, a, it's like a place where you can do certain things so that you can elevate yourself to a different plane itself. And then from the year 2007 onwards, which is roughly around 10 years before, I started uh, meeting many different gurus, many different sages. And then uh, 2008 also and 2009, then to 2009 onwards, as my Mercury period started, it became very intense because Mercury is my ninth lord. <laughs> mm. And uh, that is why it became very intense. And then 2010, uh, I went for my bachelor's and there I met so many different gurus. Uh, and worship and uh, I was in South India for my bachelors and there uh, South India is a very holy place there's a lot of temples dedicated to Lord Vishnu there and there are lots of uh, spiritual personalities and I was greatly blessed by God himself that uh, I could start meeting so many personalities and then I met them and I took divine knowledge from them and now uh, by March this year I thought it has been a long journey, around 10 years of spirituality, of reading the Bhagavad Gita and the Srimad Bhagavatam especially. And the mm -hmm. Ramayana, the Mahabharata and the Vedas, the Upanishads. Mm -hmm. So my Guru Maharaj always told me that, why don't you give out this knowledge? <laughs> so then I thought, yes, why not? That is why I opened my uh, YouTube channel in March this year. And you can always check it out. It's exotic astrology. But yep, very, soon I'm, be very soon. Yeah, very soon I'm going to change the name of the channel to Vedic Renaissance. So I don't know till the time this video is uploaded. It will be Exotic Astrology or Vedic Renaissance. But there you will get updates on astrology. And 
and different other topics like uh, the Bhagavad Gita and how to be positive in your life, stories from the scriptures which are deep rooted in the Vedic context which people don't know, which I know and some other ways also by which you can understand yourself better, not just by reading a horoscope from astrology. So that's what I wanted to say about myself. And I also have my website. The link probably will be there in the description. So if you want to book a consultation with me, then you can also go to my website. All right. <laughs> that is it from my side. <laughs> yes, it's nice to know more about you. Yeah. So what I was thinking is, I have noted down the points. Mm -hmm. And I wanted to start with something very rebellious. Because... <laughs> My moon is with Uranus, uh, Neptune, and Rahu. <laughs> okay, well, that makes sense. <laughs> so it's not going to be traditional anyways. So now uh, what I wanted to say is in the beginning that there's this concept of being rebellious. People think that rebellious means to not follow the order of the society. Do this, do that, do whatever you want. Well, that's not actually the meaning of rebellion. The scriptures tell us what actual rebellion is. And I didn't know about this. Until the time I came to see the sign of Sagittarius. If you uh, see the sign of Sagittarius, which is the original ninth sign of the zodiac belt, you will see that it is a centaur who has a bow and arrow. He is ready to shoot something. Mm -hmm. <laughs> so people cannot fathom the meaning behind the sign. They say that Oh, maybe these people are always headstrong. They are always ready to go and they are always positive. That is true because it is ruled originally by the great benefit Jupiter. But that doesn't explain where he's trying to hit and why at all he's hitting. <laughs> yes. So the answer to that is the sign Sagittarius, unlike other signs, is actually the most rebellious sign. Because a rebel says, I will shoot you. I, I deny your authority. I will not listen to you. That's what a rebel says. Yes. Well, it's interesting because Capricorn is the 10th sign. Yes. And that's authority. And Sagittarius yes. is 12th from uh -huh. that. So the negation of authority, of authority right? Uh, yeah, that is also one uh, indication. Another indication I will tell you. <laughs> okay. Generally, what they say is, uh, this indication which I'm saying is on a spiritual level. So basically, if you ask, if you go to Google and if you just uh, search rebellious signs, what will they say? Oh, Scorpio is a very rebellious sign. It doesn't follow rules. It doesn't follow restrictions. And then you have the sign of Aquarius because that is also another rebellious sign. That is true. Both are also rebellious, but they are not as rebellious as Sagittarius. The question is, why? The answer is because... Sagittarius do not follow the tradition. Well, now you may say, oh, this is contradictory. Sagittarius is the sign of religion, is the sign of spirituality. They are the people who follow the tradition. They do not break the tradition. That's what you will say. Mm -hmm. <laughs> That's what everybody thinks. But the scriptures tell us that actual rebellion is to go beyond this materialistic society and then you aim towards spirituality. Because if you want to put somebody as a rebel, then what's one of the symptoms? The number of rebellious people will be very less, right? There'll be 100 people going in a crowd and then there'll be one fellow who is standing and saying, no, I will not follow you. I will not go with the crowd. I will do something else, yes? It's actually, this is funny because my ex-boyfriend, um, he was like working on an album and he, we were trying to think of like, what's the real rebellious thing. And I used to always tell him the most, the absolute most rebellious thing you can do in today's society is believe in God or be spiritual. Yeah, yeah. I would say that to him because anyone, it's so easy to just get drunk all the time and to do drugs or to dress in black. Like that's easy, but the real rebellious hard thing to do that most people are unwilling to do is to have a faith in something greater. <laughs> Yes, and that is why it is considered to be the most rebellious sign. Yeah. And uh, there is another meaning to this bow. That is, if you know, there are certain signs in astrology which are known as uh, Marana Karak uh, signs, means Marana Karak Rashis, it means it's like death for a particular planet 
Okay. So yeah. for the planet Rahu, the sign Sagittarius is like Marana Kalaka. It means that the planet Rahu, when it goes to Sagittarius, it dies because now you are telling the dev devil that you have to chant God's names. You have to uh, follow God's traditions. So he feels like I'm dying here. Why am I here? <laughs> wow. there, another reason is that um, Sagittarius is the only place where we tend to not follow our things because we that tendency to rebel, which should actually go towards God, goes to some other place because because of this connection of Rahu. So instead of rebelling against uh, spirituality, against the scriptures, we should instead become a rebel and protest against this materialistic culture, which is just telling that eat, drink, sleep, you know, be merry, do whatever you want. And then you see the result of the society which is in front of us today. There is so much negativity. There is destruction so many places. I'm, I'm not talking of terrorism here. Terrorism is there. That is an external manifestation. But I'm speaking of the internal troubles. There are so many divorces which are happening. There are so many cases of abuse. There is so much depression. In fact, one of my friends, he is studying in a premier institute of India. He told me, I was shocked to listen to this, that in his college, in a similar college like his, in last week, there are two suicide cases. He is studying in Indian Institute of Management in Bangalore, South India. So whoever uh, is from India, they know that's a very famous college. It's one of the world's uh, very good colleges for studying MBA, uh, Masters in Business actually. So if people are committing suicides in premier MBA institutes also, then what's the hope left? Yes. Now the question is why they are committing suicide? Because they are feeling a sense of lack they are feeling a sense of deprivation there. That is why they are feeling that our expectations are not met. Yes. Now, why they are feeling that? Because from the childhood, the materialistic society has put things into your head. Oh, you must have a million dollar job. Otherwise, you're poor. <laughs> you must have the most uh, beautiful girl in the town. Otherwise, you don't have anybody. Or your boyfriend has to be a millionaire. Or he has to be the most handsome person. Only then... Uh, they will uh, value you, right? Otherwise, uh, you are not anybody special here. So when you are imprinted with all these materialistic fantasies, then what happens? When you grow up and then you see that I'm not able to do all this, which is simply an illusion because even if you don't have a job of a million dollars, you are not going to die. Even if it is half a million, right? <laughs> you can happily sustain in half a million dollars <laughs> but no that that progression uh, has happened and society has told you that no 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 you you have to have a job of, of 1 million dollars. And then tomorrow it goes to 10 million then i don't know how many it goes to billion from the childhood itself and not from the childhood in fact from the time you are in your mother's womb <laughs> these uh, illusions have been portrayed to everybody that if you don't have this this you you are not good enough. And if you see how the upbringing of the child is from the childhood, every moment he will be having this realization that there is something missing in me because he will go to one place and then they will say, okay, your weight is more. So you cannot play basketball. You cannot play football. You cannot do this. You cannot get this. You cannot, 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 cannot. <laughs> so when a person keeps hearing this always, and in psychology also they say that if you tell a normal person every day that you are mad, you are mad, you are mad, <laughs> then even if the person is normal, he or she will start believing that uh, he is a mad person or she is a mad, mad girl. So when uh, we see that these artificial materialistic impositions have been uh, thrown on us and we have been following all this and we have been religiously, because Sagittarius is the sign of religion, so we have been religiously idolizing all these materialistic beliefs. And there you see what uh, the society has come up to now. There are so many places where people are suffering. Yes. And that is why uh, Sagittarius is uh, the most rebellious sign because they say that we will not listen to what the media is telling. Media, I don't mean the news people here. It, it can be any anybody. The propaganda about movies, about 
so many uh, varieties of enjoyment which uh, the media promises but sagittarius says no no i will not uh, listen to you i will only listen listen to what the sages say or to only what jesus said if if i am christian then i will follow the 10 commandments mm-hmm. so that becomes uh, the biggest rebellion of today's society because the numbers are very few you can count in hands <laughs> how many there are 7 billion people i guess in this world and then how many you can count maybe 100 or 100000 very genuine uh, very strong uh, spiritual personality so that is why it is the most uh, rebellious sign it is not scorpio it is not aquarius yes so that's what i wanted to say and then now i wanted to bring the concept of bhagavad gita here which is the holy book from the vedic tradition which was spoken by lord krishna who is one of the incarnations of lord vishnu one of the 10 incarnations and lord krishna spoke this divine uh, the word bhagavad gita means bhagavat means god bhagavan and gita means song so it is like god is singing a song please hear it <laughs> so uh, the bhagavad gita was spoken to a person called arjuna he was one of the primary warriors in fact the best of the warriors of the in the battlefield of kurukshetra there was a great battle in the indian history named as the battle of kurukshetra upon which the biggest epic of india mahabharat is named <laughs> so in that what happened was this person called arjuna he had to fight against his enemies who were unfortunately his relatives and yeah. he was he was having a panic inside he was he was losing all his power because he said oh my god i cannot fight with my grandfather i cannot fight with the person who taught me his guru okay i cannot fight with my cousins because what is the winning uh, use of winning the war if everybody is killed everything is destroyed but then lord krishna told him no don't think that they will die they will not die and don't think that they will always live because if you think that they are the body then they are going to perish one day anyway even if you don't kill them i will kill them in form of time kalos me that's what lord krishna says in the bhagavad gita i will kill them in the in the form of time and if you think they are souls then why are you worrying they will never die <laughs> so irrespective of you think they are souls or they are bodies the the end is going to come if they are bodies and if they are souls they they, they will never die so in that lord krishna says to arjuna that whatever state of being one remembers at the time of death that state he shall attain without fail that means whatever you are remembering at the time of death that is the thing that will lead you to the next birth mm-hmm. next birth in the sense to the next destination for example if you are uh, thinking of your dog when you are dying <laughs> then uh, you may take birth as a dog's body if you are thinking of your uh, spouse then you may take birth as the same gender i mean the same gender of your spouse yes if you are thinking of god then lord krishna says in the same bhagavad gita that yad gatva anani vartante tad dhama param mama one who reaches my abode will never come back again in this world because see when you are thinking of god then he will go back to his abode then he will never come back so then that's what lord krishna says so in astrology which house represents this <laughs> going to god ah uh, no 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 not god what krishna said your desire will take you <laughs> your desire will take you hmm. yes. it is the seventh house because that's the house of endings it's where the sun sets yes and um, seventh house is originally the house of desire this people take the seventh house as the house of marriage relationships that is true that's secondary the most prominent aspect of the seventh house is it is the house of desire what you desire basically <laughs> and among all the desires the desire for opposite sex is the most prominent that is what parashara has put seventh house for marriage and he has said okay this seventh house 
is uh, having the sign of Libra, where there are people coming together. Basically, what happens when people come together? They will start sharing things, and they, the, the enjoyment increases when uh, there are people sharing things. Right? That's what Libra is. So that means seventh house becomes uh, the most important house because ultimately uh, that is the house that will uh, take you to wherever. Yes, because there are different there are different stories in Shrimad Bhagavatam. There is one great king, Bharat Maharaj, after whom uh, the Holy Land of India is named Bharata. So Bharat Maharaj, he was a great personality, and he renounced his kingdom and he went to the forest to seek spiritual enlightenment. But what happened was he renounced his most beautiful wife. He renounced all his kingdom, all his pleasures, opulences, everything he renounced and he went to the forest to stay like a hermit and he was chanting God's names there. And he was very elevated spiritually. In fact, it is said he was in the bhava stage, which is the eighth stage of spiritual perfection, about which maybe we will talk some other day. So uh, in that bhava state, what happens is you get emotions for God, just like you feel emotions for another person in this world. And his eyes were dripping with tears when he used to think of uh, Lord Vishnu. He was having so much emotions. But <laughs> something terrible happened that time. There was uh, that, that was a bad day and there was a lot of rain and thunder and shower. And then what happened was as he was moving, suddenly there was a storm. And then he fell into a ditch. And then what happened? There was a deer, lady deer. <laughs> and this deer, she gave birth to another deer. She was like pregnant and she had a miscarriage or whatever you call it. And then this baby deer, this baby deer fell in the hands of Bharat Maharaj. <laughs> and then her, uh, I don't know the gender of this baby, so I will take it her. <laughs> so her mother passed away. And then Bharat Maharaj was left with this baby deer and he was wondering what to do. And then he was confused. And then what he did, he was doing his spiritual practices. But what he did was he kept this deer beside him. <laughs> and he used to touch the deer, kiss the deer, nourish the deer, feed the deer. So what happened by this? Gradually, he started developing attachment towards the deer. Mm -hmm. Because of that, he started neglecting his spiritual principles. He thought, okay, today I will roam with this deer. Okay, I can do my spiritual activities later. It's not a big deal. And then he was doing this, doing this, and a state came that he completely ignored his spiritual activities. He it, it, it's technically called a fall down from spiritual uh, life. So then what happened? There was another day. It was a very stormy day. And once again, when he was going in the forest, he again fell in a ditch. <laughs> and this time, that fall which he had physically was lethal. He did not survive. It was a very bad blow. And then what happened? When he was dying, this baby deer was there in front of him. And then when he was dying, he was thinking of this baby deer. <laughs> As the Srimad Bhagavatam says, my dear deer. <laughs> and then what happened? He died. He left his body. And as Lord Krishna says, Anta kale chamame was maran muktva kaleva. Whatever you think during the time of death, that state you shall let him. So he took another body and in this life, he was born as a deer. That's miserable. And when he took birth as deer, by grace of God, again I'm saying by God's grace, he was empowered to remember that in past life, he was this great king, Bharat Maharaj, and he was so elevated and he fell down from his position because of this deer. That's a very special blessing which God gave him. And this time when he took birth as a deer, my God, <laughs> he was very vigilant. He was very strict. He was very serious. So what he did, the fifth canto of Bhagavatam describes, he went to the ashram of Pulaha, the great sage 
Pulaha. So this Pulaha Rishi was there and then he went to that ashram and wherever these sages would be sitting and doing fire sacrifices and chanting mantras, he would go and stand uh, nearby them and he would be hearing as a deer. Can you imagine? So he was a deer, but he had that elevated consciousness of a human being, of a great uh, spiritually elevated yogi. And then what happened? He continued doing this and he performed severe austerities. He will eat the worst of the worst grass which is available. <laughs> he will not eat all those no, fleshy green grass which is coming. He, he said, no, I did something very bad. I ignored my spiritual principles, so I will punish myself this time. That's not kind of a punishment, it's kind of an atonement. So he took responsibility for his actions. And then what happened? One day death came again. <laughs> and then this deer also died. Deer means Bharat Maharaj himself. And then next life, because he was very spiritually elevated, even as a deer, he took another birth as a human being. And in this birth, he perfected his life and he attained spiritual perfection. So this is the story of the seventh house. So seventh house is very important for us to um, give uh, to have a reality check on ourselves. What kind of desires are we having? It is is it only to uh, get married or to get into a relationship or to get a good job or to get some name fame status in the society or are we cultivating great desires also? Because in the world of spirituality, there is a misconception, unfortunately, that desire is bad. I am repeating. <laughs> People say that, no, no, it's not good to desire, actually. No. You have to kill desire. Desire is the root cause of all problems. No, that is not true. Because in the scriptures, like the Vedanta Sutra, it is mentioned that Raso Vai Saha, which means the absolute truth, which is God, He is the source of all happiness. So, Mamai Vamsha Jiva Loke Jiva Bhuta Sanatana. This is what Lord Krishna says in the Gita that every living entity is my part and parcel. So, that means if God has desire, the living entity will also have desire, every soul. So, to say that desire is bad is wrong actually. The problem is the desires are materialistic. That is the problem. Problem is not desire. Because, suppose I tell you now that. Oh, go and sit and don't think about anything. Not just go and close your eyes. Well, that's not possible actually. <laughs> because if you are thinking of not to think something, you're still thinking, right? <laughs> it's like saying that don't think of a white monkey if I tell you like this. <laughs> mm -hmm. So then that's the only thing you'll be thinking of, right? So to negate desires is foolishness because living entity will have desires. But the problem is when those desires are redirected only towards materialistic objects like opposite sex or money and name, fame, position, showbiz. Yes. So the problem is in our desires. It, it is not in desire itself. So next time when we uh, have a chance to obtain spiritual desires, that's great actually. Because that itself will take us to God. It is not just not having material desires will not give us spiritual perfection. That is like you are in level zero. Yes, but you also have to have spiritual desires. Only then you will obtain spiritual perfection. So that is what I wanted to say about uh, the seventh house. And now I will say about certain uh, conjunctions which occur in the sky, which are uh, as per astronomy very frequent. Yes, like Sun, Mercury, Sun, Venus, and Sun, Mercury, Venus, all three. Mm -hmm. These conjunctions are ideally very frequently occurring in charts and even Mercury, Venus also. Mm -hmm. so the question is uh, why do they occur frequently? <laughs> People will say that no, no, astronomically, what happens is Sun, is, uh, sun Mercury, Venus, all three are very close. Yeah. Um, but uh, that's a physical manifestation of the reality, that is not the cause. Well, uh, sun could be near to Jupiter also. <laughs> it could have been near to Saturn also. But why is only Mercury Venus near to the sun? Why is not Jupiter? <laughs> the answer is because, see, when we say that sun is very close to Mercury Venus, it means that sun is what? What, what is the sun? Sun is the self, the Atma, that consciousness which has try to come to this material realm and it is trying to prove himself, right? That's what the, the, the sun is. The sun is one actually. 
the sun is coming up every day we are seeing the same sun our father is seeing the same sun we are also seeing the same sun it's not different so basically what happens every living entity in this world is trying to prove that they are like the sun basically that is why they are that is why sun is the primary significator why, why is it not jupiter why is it not saturn why do they say that wherever sun is placed that sign is very important why because the living entity is trying to act like the sun what is the trait of the sun that whenever it shines nothing else is visible <laughs> nothing else is visible means when you look towards the sun you cannot see anything else so that is what everybody is trying to do in this world they are trying to show that look man i am here <laughs> you don't see me my god i am there i am the boss here i am the king i am the main man here either you are a boy or you are a girl that's the same thing you are doing and that manifests in different ways that is why people like to boast about their achievements basically what they are doing they are trying to prove others that oh you are uh, i am like the sun yes because the sun is all effulgent that is why whenever somebody criticizes us we feel very bad why <laughs> criticism means it is they are pointing out certain faults and the sun is faultless <laughs> that is why that pinches us very much that means when somebody is criticizing us it is like telling you don't appear like the sun yes you are not that important here basically <laughs> yeah, so okay. now what happens is what is mercury venus mercury represents friends social circles networking basically money yes buddha represents money basically and what is venus venus represents love luxury sexuality partners romance all these things so now the question is why are these three always together because you will see see now first of all i will say what does these conjunctions mean sun if it is conjunct with mercury or with venus it simply means that the sun needs the other planet to feel like it is the sun should i repeat <laughs> the sun suppose sun and mercury are together in somebody's chart then the person has difficulty in continuing in his life if mercury is not there because it is like now sun has become sun and mercury so that is why these people will always be surrounded by friends these people will always listen to what their friends say yes yeah it's true i've seen it sun that. yeah yeah so and if sun venus are together which also happens very frequently that means what these persons they have they need the support of venus that is why in india there is uh, this thing about no love marriage arranged marriage love marriage basically is like the west uh, that you meet somebody and then you get married with the person so in my experience i found out that sun with venus is the biggest it is the number one indicator of somebody who will always be driving towards love and romance and affairs because now see it is very simple you think that you are sitting in a room you know you you are the sun suppose and now suppose venus is also there <laughs> so it's like there's a girl who is sitting there uh, and now the sun says okay i will take this resolve i will do this from tomorrow and then the girl says no no why you are doing this you listen to me also <laughs> yes and suppose mercury is there then the friends will come and tell you oh i think you should do this you should do it like that yes so whenever sun is alone in somebody's chart then it is understood that the person will will be able to execute his will without any hindrance without any hindrance means unless other malefics like uh saturn or rahu or ketu is not affecting yes then that will be modified but i am just saying individually if sun is sitting alone then these people i have seen they have the power to uh, go on a ride themselves <laughs> basically what happens is they don't want validation from either mercury or venus that yes yes is what you are doing is right yeah and uh, if you see most of the people they need validation <laughs> yeah even, even when it comes to spiritual practices even then they need somebody to keep telling them always no no you are going right you are doing nice you are you are doing good that is why if sun is alone or if sun is with ketu 
then this is very fabulous for spiritual pursuits where there is no hindrance which means if sun is sitting with venus then whenever you think of spirituality you will always somehow fall back into the venusian traits which is what luxury romance sexuality now i'm not saying that if you have this combination you cannot become spiritual i'm not saying that what i'm saying is you will have a tendency to gravitate towards all those things yes yeah. so similarly if jupiter is there with sun then that's fabulous that's perhaps the best thing that can happen apart from uh, sun being with ketu because sun and ketu conjunction is known as shiva yoga if that is happening in the ninth house especially yes because then what happens ketu is the natural karga for moksha and then you feel that yes this is what i need to attain and there's no uh, there's no obstruction because there's no mercury there's no venus also so there's nobody to stop you <laughs> so you can go ahead you can go on and on and on and mercury venus is another conjunction which is frequently occurring yeah and this is basically a very social combination mercury venus if it's conjunct in anybody's chart you will see that these people are very social <laughs> that they can mix very freely with other people and most of the people you will see they will be able to mix with others most of the people i mean uh, 30% or 40% you will find that they are like oh we don't get along with anybody you know we hate everybody we just want to stay ourselves no you will not find like that sun alone is very rare see even if it is not with mercury venus it will be with some other planet <laughs> so it is very uh, rare that sun is alone or it is with jupiter or it is with ketu yes and what happens if sun is sitting with saturn then the saturn uh, saturn traits come into play for the sun which is what saturn tells you no 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 you are not good enough <laughs> yeah that's a hard one i think people have a hard time with that yeah and that uh, what happens is saturn gets exalted in libra so the libra energy comes to the sun so now it's like a king who is going into a marketplace and nobody respects him there <laughs> so he feels miserable so these people uh, may have the tendency to doubt themselves yes anyway so that's what i wanted to say about uh, the frequently occurring conjunctions and what they mean and they have great significance in our life because mostly people are either with friends or with the opposite sex and if sun is with both mercury venus then my god <laughs> you are torn between the two should i do what i want or what my friend is telling or what my wife or my husband is telling so good luck with that <laughs> so now what i wanted to say is there are certain uh, yogas uh, which are sometimes very feared in astrology for example one of that is the kala sarpa yoga which occurs technically as per astrology if the, all the other planets are in one side of the rahu ketu axis for example if rahu is in the uh, first house and ketu is in the uh, seventh house because rahu ketu will always be seven houses apart and if all the other uh, seven planets are on this side or on that side all on one side then this uh, yoga occurs and this will be true for any placement of rahu ketu in the chart so basically there is a lot of fear mongering about this yoga that oh my god this is called kala sarpa yoga the people will die i will die my ancestors will die no it doesn't mean that it simply means that see what, what is kala kala is time and what is sarpa sarpa is the snake rahu is the head and ketu is the back part is the tail so basically what happens is kala sarpa means you are under the stringent grip of time of this snake called rahu ketu now who is rahu ketu rahu ketu basically represents our desires <laughs> rahu ketu is actually rahu is actually death that is why have you noticed there are uh, the sun moon never goes retrograde retrograde means uh, if you compare to the earth it is like moving backwards and rahu ketu are always moving backwards they never go straight so you see this sun and moon are moving ahead and rahu ketu are always moving backwards what does this mean see other planets they can be straight or stationary or retrograde also but sun moon rahu ketu will never change their uh, direction <laughs> what does this mean it simply means that 
sun moon is ourselves our body our health we and we are moving forward and they don't go retrograde it means you cannot go back to time that's not possible and now rahu ketu they represent death and death is always <laughs> coming towards us so see we are going towards death and death is coming we cannot stop this <laughs> if at all sun moon had been retrograde then probably they could have reversed this but that's not possible because they never go retrograde that means we are also moving close towards death and death is also moving close towards us that is what is the meaning of uh, uh, rahu and ketu and when we say about kalsarp yoga what it means is see basically if all the planets are in one side of rahu ketu it simply means that that part of our life is so strongly deep rooted inside us because all planets are on one side the other side is completely empty that means this is a sim- this is the sign of a terribly disbalanced horoscope <laughs> mm-hmm. that means the person has completely ignored some areas of his life now i am not saying that is good or bad that may be good that may be bad i am not saying on that but what i am saying is when we get too much obsessed with certain things then we get more and more entangled in the law of karma and that is why obsession means all the planets are on one side where what happens we get more entangled in karma which is what rahu ketu axis is basically so that is the uh, meaning of kalsar yoga we need not fear this yoga we simply have to understand that the, the certain focus areas have been strong in our life very strong impeccable in fact and that is why we uh, have to make a conscious decision in this life that whether we should uh, continue those areas will it give us a spiritual fulfillment or will it not give us because for these people uh, it's a very polar chart so reverting back becomes very difficult because they have never done it <laughs> mm-hmm. yeah. so the rahu ketu axis shows our past life obsessions yes so that's what is the meaning of kal sat yoga and there is nothing to fear we just have to evaluate should that should we continue at all in that direction if no then we have the power to change it yes and now there is another uh, yoga which is known as shrapit yoga <laughs> that uh, that's known as a cursed yoga that means there's a uh, curse of somebody here so that's the conjunction of saturn and rahu yes and basically what saturn is saturn represents your actions your karma and rahu represents cheatings <laughs> so when saturn and rahu are together it shows that whichever zodiac sign or whichever house it is placed it shows that some terrible cheating you have performed <laughs> regarding to that sign or to that house now from many 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 lifetimes it is not one or two it's like your default program setting wow <laughs> that is why that is why this is one of the symptoms of addiction and so many other things black magic also so now for example if saturn rahu is conjunct in the sign of mercury <laughs> that means it is some friend or relative who you have cheated <laughs> and the position of mercury will tell us what was the level of that person for example suppose saturn rahu is conjunct in the sign of sagittarius which is the sign ruled by jupiter okay that means it is related to a spiritual personality that personality has given you a curse now suppose jupiter in that horoscope is debilitated in the sign of capricorn suppose then it means that that spiritual personality who gave you a curse he was not a very elevated personality he was in his beginning days of spiritual encounters because it is debilitated debilitated doesn't mean bad it simply means beginning whenever a planet is debilitated it simply means that you have come across that planet in a situation where it is at the lowest <laughs> yeah that is the meaning of the word debilitated and exalted means that that planet when you see it is like it's at the top yes <laughs> that's the meaning of exaltation so if that jupiter is debilitated it means that uh, the person who cursed you that spiritual person 
he uh, was in the beginning days of his spiritual life or he was just beginning he or she <laughs> but what if that uh, jupiter is in a friend sign if it is in a sign of mars or a uh, sign of leo uh, it's like uh, or any other sign where jupiter performs very good then that means the personality was very elevated and what if it is in a sign like sagittarius my god <laughs> some great uh, brahma rishi like vasishtha or parashara might have cursed you <laughs> and if it is exalted in cancer then a great personality who is a bhakti yogi follower bhakti yogi means one who has emotions for god that personality has cursed you somebody like narad muni maybe <laughs> Yeah. so so that will tell us so now the thing is in 2010 i think there was some few days when saturn rahu was together it was in the month of april like so sorry not 2010 i said 1991 i mean and recently also it was conjunct i guess in the sign of libra if i am not wrong i mean i am talking as per sidereal zodiac so uh, in 1991 uh, i think two three of my friends because i am born in that time 92 so some of my friends have this conjunction and that was happening in the sign of capricorn so what does this mean that the curse is related to somebody who is a servant because saturn is the servant mm-hmm. is the down to the lower class people and now where is saturn sitting saturn was also sitting in capricorn so that means capricorn is the sign of status so it is a royal servant royal means not very great but it's still a very powerful servant <laughs> so the more powerful the dispositor of the saturn rahu sign is to that degree the curse is severe so then what's the remedy it's very simple go and in this life go and try to please people who represent those areas for example if saturn rahu is in signs like sagittarius or pisces then go and uh, try to do some donations to spiritual personalities or to temples or mosques that's one of the remedy again if it is in the sign of taurus or libra then some terrible lady has cursed you <laughs> then you have to go and uh, do some donations some charity some mantras so many other remedies are there in astrology yes you have to do that for ladies especially you can do on fridays yes. especially if uh, this is in signs like taurus and libra more more in libra because libra is the most common sign so that's what i wanted to share and apart from this what should i share yes the part of remedies so there are so many remedies the question is what to do which one to do <laughs> yeah that we can only say when we uh, check individual horoscopes it is not recommended that we give a general remedy to anybody but there are certain placements which give us an indication and this is true irrespective of you are a indian or you are from america or you are a hindu or you are a muslim irrespective of that this is true for example which is the house of remedies actually in astrology it is the fifth house because it is the house of mantra yes mantra means uh, that which delivers the mind mana trai mana is the mind and trai means to deliver so that which frees you from the anxieties of the mind that is mantra so now before we go to mantras which i will not do here because there are many mantras which we have to be very specific towards the chart but what i'm saying here is fifth house is also the house of love because fifth house represents that which is very natural for you <laughs> fifth house represents those things which nobody needs to tell you you understand yourself <laughs> that is why they say that uh, love is not uh, external it's a matter of the heart so you cannot explain what love is you cannot write it down and say this is love but it's something you understand right inside yourself and nobody needs to tell you that or maybe you are in love with this person you understand yourself <laughs> so whichever planet is situated there significations related to that house will be very natural for you mm. and those um, devatas or those dts will also be very natural for you for example on a broad spectrum i would say if somebody has jupiter in the 5th house or it is having 
Rashi Drishti means aspect of the sign as per Jaimini. Then, if he's an Indian, directly go and ask him, do you have a fascination for Lord Shiva? <laughs> he will directly say yes. <laughs> what if it's a foreigner, non-Indian? Then you go and ask him, have you heard of Lord Shiva? He or she may say, no, no, I have not heard. But you go and show him Lord Shiva's photo. He will start his spiritual life. <laughs> now what if Mercury is there? Mercury represents Lord Vishnu. Then if somebody has Mercury, then you go and ask, my dear sir, uh, do you like to worship Lord Vishnu, Narayana, Lord Narayana, 400 form? And you say, yes, 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 yes. I have always been doing it. <laughs> And there are different avatars of Vishnu, the 10 incarnations, primarily known. That's why I'm saying 10, there are millions of incarnations. Mm -hmm. Now, what if uh, there are planets like Venus, which is placed uh, with Mercury? What if planet like Sun is placed with Mercury? That will give us an indication, or what if Moon is placed there with Mercury, I'm saying. That will give us an indication what kind of a Vishnu avatar you should worship. Not you should worship, which you will worship. <laughs> because this is not an imposed regulation that you should worship. No, this you will do naturally. You don't know it. Maybe you have not seen their photo if you are a foreigner, I mean non-Indian, or probably you have seen it. But it somehow it will come to you very naturally. For example, sun, if it is placed there with Mercury, then uh, the avatar of Vishnu, which is connected to sun, should be worshipped. Who is that avatar? It's Lord Ram himself. <laughs> So Ram, uh, you, you, you will always see Sun Mercury in the fifth house people. You tell them about Lord Ram once, that's it. I have seen so many people I know. They are like, yes, yes, yes. We will follow Lord Ram. Whatever he says, we will do that. Now what if uh, Mercury is placed with moon there? That means the avatar of Vishnu, which is connected to moon, that has to be worshipped. Which is that avatar? It's Lord Krishna himself. So moon Mercury in the fifth house. You can directly say, go and worship Lord Krishna. Now, uh, what if Mercury is there with Venus? Now, Venus represents the female in the chart. Okay. <laughs> that doesn't mean that you have to go and worship your wife. <laughs> it simply means that, um, suppose Mercury, Venus, both are there. Or even if Jupiter, Venus is there, then it means... You have to also take into account the female counterpart of that deity. Mm, yeah. So for example, you will always find people who have Jupiter Venus conjunct in the fifth house. You go and tell them, Oh, you should worship Lord Shiva. They will say, No, 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 I'm not interested. <laughs> Why? But the moment you go and tell them, Oh, uh, this is a photo where his wife is also there, Parvati. Then these people will be like, oh, this is very nice. <laughs> I like this photo. And if there is Mercury Venus with Moon, then Moon Mercury, as I said, Lord Krishna. And then they want Lord Krishna's spouse also in that. Now he has uh, so many spouses. I, I don't know which one to take. <laughs> he has 16,108 uh, queens he had. But you can take any form which you like. Either it is Radha or Krishna or it is Rukmini Krishna or it is Lakshmi Narayan. Yes. And what if uh, Mercury Venus is placed alone without sun or moon? Then you can take Vishnu and his wife, which is Lakshmi. And if it is with sun, sun, Mercury, Venus, which is again very frequent, then it is Mercury, Vishnu and sun is Ram and Venus is the wife of Lord Ram, who is Sita Devi. So... Uh, this is how uh, you understand what to do and what not to do. No? So there are different ways by which you can figure out. And when you uh, give, these, uh, give these suggestions to people, I have seen that people call me and tell that, oh, the, from the moment you said, do this, do that, then my life has changed. I have become a different person. And another symptom of remedies working is people will come and tell you that you have changed. <laughs> So that's one of the uh, symptoms that remedies are working. And the last thing I would say is there are so many remedies. But there's one prerequisite of every remedy. Do you know that? That prerequisite is, see, uh, generally there are remedies which are done through gemstones. But 
before going to gemstones, we have to understand which planet signifies gemstones. <laughs> that is the planet moon. Moon signifies gemstones. I've heard Mars sometimes. Okay. I don't so, know why. Uh, yeah, maybe Mars also. <laughs> Mars, like, because it comes from the Earth and like caves and things like that, you know? Yeah, Mars, obviously it has, uh, because it's fire, it has connection to Jyotish. So Mar Sun, Mars are always having the connection with Jyotish. Yes, because uh, Jyotish is basically what? Jyoti Isha. Jyoti means light and Isha is God. That light which leads us to God. That's what Jyotish is. So Mars will definitely have an impact. About gemstones, they say that if moon is not well placed in somebody's chart, the remedies pertaining to gemstones will not work. Wow, okay. Now the question is why? Don't just blindly believe when somebody says something. There's an explanation to this. The answer is the remedy is that gemstone, what, what it does, it can do either of the two things. It can either pull the rays of that planet <laughs> or it can negate the rays of that planet. If that planet is very badly spoiled in your chart and it is in a prominent position, then the other one will be true. It, you can wear gemstones to reduce the effect of the plant. Okay. But unless your mind is peaceful, <laughs> yeah. you cannot use them. <laughs> that is why in astrology, the moon, the Chandra Lagna, the moon ascendant is given very much importance. Mm -hmm. For example, if somebody has special great yogas like now one of the pancha mahapurush yogas ruchak mahapurush yoga suppose a person has now the mahapurush yoga will only be there in kendra which means the first fourth seventh and tenth houses so suppose mars is in aries in the first house it's creating a ruchak mahapurush yoga very powerful yoga but uh, what if your moon is in the second house <laughs> then that yoga will not function why? Because now see how it happens is from the ascendant, Mars is giving this Mahapurush Yoga because it is in the Kendra. That means whenever it comes to physical things, Kendra is physical, that which is manifesting in your life, that will be very strong. You will externally look like a very uh, like uh, army general. Now you'll be very commanding and people will fear you. That trait of Mars is everybody fears him. <laughs> Mars loves to make people fearful of him. <laughs> yes. So then what happens is now from the moon, it is in the 12th house. So that means externally you are looking as if you are a great uh, army general. But whenever it comes to your mind, it is in the 12th house of laws. <laughs> so even if the government of a country makes you a general, you will not be happy there. That is why have you seen sometimes there are planets in Dusthanas from the Lagna 6th, 8th, 12th. But some people are rejoicing in that so much. How? <laughs> from the moon it is well placed. That's the secret. <laughs> mm, yeah. For example, if somebody has Venus in the 6th house, that is like you are falling in love with people with whom you fight. Yeah. You are, you are in love with your enemies, or which also means your loved one has become your enemies, right? <laughs> but, yes. but suppose uh, moon is in the uh, second house. Suppose. <laughs> then what is happening is, from the moon, Venus is in trines. And planets in trines will always support each other. They will not enhance. They will just help to maintain. Kendras will enhance. They will push. Trines will just support. Now, these people I've seen, if we, uh, this terrible, so-called terrible Venus, <laughs> which is in the sixth house, is in Kendra or in trines from the moon, then these people will find a lot of happiness in that. <laughs> these people do not like stable relationships. They want two, three breakups and then they will be like, okay, you know, I want this, I want this. If there is stability in the relationship, they feel that there's some problem. <laughs> right. Because from the moon, it is not uh, very well placed. Uh, from the moon, is very well placed. <laughs> but the problem is, 
lagna is the physical from the lagna it's very badly placed so that is why this explains uh, when people say oh this planet is very badly placed but why am i so much obsessed about it because you have not checked it from the moon <laughs> it's very true so that is how you interpret different uh, yogas and different placements so i hope for today this basics would be good enough and some other day we will discuss on other uh, spiritual topics from the bhagavatam and vedic cosmology that is it from my side <laughs> yeah i thought this was so interesting and i love to hear about the different mythologies and when you get to learn those stories it really makes a lot of vedic astrology make so much more sense and i just haven't read all of them yet and so thank you for sharing all that in context of astrology yeah there are so many stories actually but um, the thing is we have to know how to interpret those uh, stories also for mm -hmm. example they say this, this sun venus conjunction uh, now the big question is uh, which planet does good there <laughs> yeah does the sun do good or does venus the answer is very simple you have to go to the ramayan for this <laughs> because lord ram represents the sun and what does uh, who, who is represented uh, who is representing venus it is uh, parshuram one of the avatars of vishnu mm -hmm. when sita ram were about to marry they married and then lord ram had broken that uh, lord shiva's bow because he had to prove that to win sita in marriage and then parshuram was a disciple of lord shiva and when parshuram heard that my god lord shiva's bow has been broken he was in a wrath <laughs> <laughs> and he came and said who is that rascal who has broken the bow of lord shiva <laughs> he will not live a moment <laughs> to breathe and then uh, it is said, said about parshuram that he was so powerful he was so powerful he was so powerful that if he would glance at a pregnant lady she would have miscarriage wow his eyesight was so fearful and it was so dreaded so dangerous it would bring death <laughs> mm. and when he appeared the assembly then every king started falling at his feet and they started telling my ancestor was this my ancestor was that they are trying to show how uh, how good or how great they are from their ancestral lineage and then parshuram said get lost all of you <laughs> and then later what happened this past time gets over and ultimately lord ram tells that my dear parshuram <laughs> your job is now over now it is time for me to take over because i am the avatar of vishnu which is in charge of treta yuga mm -hmm. and then what happens parshuram parshuram and ram they challenge each other yes before that and then parshuram by his divine power he understands that i cannot fight with this person because he is lord vishnu himself <laughs> and then by his meditation he understands that this is vishnu himself and then he surrenders and then lord ram says but i have put this arrow in my bow and this will never be wasted so what do you want me to do should i send it to this direction or that direction mm -hmm. <laughs> if i send it this side then all your powers which you have will be extinguished because parshuram had the power to walk with the in the speed of the mind you could just think i am in dallas now and tomorrow i am in india that's it you are in india <laughs> now itself <laughs> and then he said or should i throw it that side that uh, you will not be able to sleep anywhere and then parshuram said no 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 <laughs> i have already donated this entire earth to rishi kashyap so i don't have any place to sleep and i need to go to this uh, mahendra parvat the mountain to sleep so please don't take that away from me you can destroy all my powers i don't need <laughs> mm -hmm. and the lord ram releases the arrow and all his powers are destroyed so now what do you understand by this <laughs> whenever sun and venus are conjunct <laughs> then the aspects of venus 
get minimized because yeah. because now it is with such a big planet yes and we will have to make choices in our life to follow the path of the sun and sometimes we might have to leave venus yes <laughs> that's what is the meaning because and sometimes we may be forced to do that because that's what happens and parshuram came first <laughs> so the problem will come from the side of venus sun will never obstruct venus but venus will always try to obstruct the sun which means uh, your your loved ones your partners they may always be opposing what you want to do in life and if you sit and listen to them then probably <laughs> that will never be achieved yeah. that doesn't mean you don't listen to them but uh, if that is a part of your spiritual journey you have to let go of these people otherwise ram and parshuram cannot stay together <laughs> very true well thank you so much and i'm sure that i'll have you back on again so thank you and for everyone that was watching um all of the information to get in contact with baba jeet will be in the description box please check out his channel it's really great i was on there recently so yeah have a wonderful day and i'll talk to you later yeah thank you namaste to everybody